Hello, I'm Robin Byrne, Associate Professor of Astronomy at Northeast State Community College in Bluntville, Tennessee. And behind the camera is Adam Thans, Director of the Planetarium at Bayes Mountain Park and Planetarium in Kingsport, Tennessee. And today we're going to take you on a trip through our solar system. We are going to do a scaled down model where one foot is equal to one million kilometers. And on that scale, our Death Star here is about the size of the sun. Um, it's actually a little bit too small, but it was the closest I could find. And so from the sun, we're going to be walking to each of the planets. And it ends up being a lot bigger than you think it is. And the planets end up being a lot smaller than you think they're going to be. The first planet from the sun is Mercury. And on our scale, it's going to take me 29 steps to get to Mercury. So let's go. Welcome to Mercury. So here is Mercury on our scale. It is a sesame seed. And so you see it's much smaller than the sun. And we did 29 steps. Um, some interesting things to know about Mercury. On my interesting facts sheet. Mercury has the largest temperature difference between day and night. It is as hot as 800 degrees Fahrenheit during the daytime and gets down to almost negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit at night. And that's because Mercury, one, is close to the sun, so that's going to make it hot, but also it doesn't have an atmosphere. So once you hit the nighttime sky, all the heat dissipates into space, so it gets quite cold at night. Uh, the day-night cycle on Mercury is uh, very bizarre because for every three orbits around the sun, Mercury spins on its axis, its daytime only happens twice. So basically every three Mercury years is two Mercury days. So it would not feel like Earth at all as far as the day-night cycle is concerned. Despite being as hot as it is, there's actually ice on Mercury in craters at the poles we have found evidence that there is ice in places that never receive sunlight, so they never get warm, so it stays cold enough for ice to remain there. So our next planet is Venus. Now Venus is a total of 54 steps from the sun, but we've already done 29. So my next step is gonna be number 30, and then we'll stop when we get to Venus. Welcome to Venus. So Venus on our scale is the size of a peppercorn. So bigger than Mercury, but still tiny compared to our Death Star Sun. Now as far as interesting facts about Venus, we talked about Mercury being hot. Venus is actually hotter. It is the hottest planet in the solar system at a constant 900 degrees Fahrenheit day and night. And that's because it has a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. And you've heard of the greenhouse effect that carbon dioxide does. Well, Venus is an example of how bad the greenhouse effect can be if you have a lot of carbon dioxide in your atmosphere. So it becomes broiling hot on Venus. Venus is also cloud covered. We cannot see the surface of Venus from Earth. And the clouds are sulfuric acid. So it actually has acid rain on Venus. And if that wasn't bad enough, 
atmospheric pressure on Venus is about 90 times the atmospheric pressure on Earth. So it would crush you, it would broil you, and it would dissolve you with acid if you happen to go to Venus. So um, cross that off your travel plans if you are planning to go to Venus, despite being called Earth's sister planet. So we visited Venus, which was 54 steps. Earth is our next stop at 75 steps. So my next step is going to be 55. Welcome to Earth. So here we have Earth and our moon. Earth is a peppercorn, so it's about the same size as Venus. That's part of why we said Venus was the sister planet. Our moon over here is a little poppy seed. And so that's how far the moon is from the Earth on our scale here. And so some interesting facts about Earth. You probably know most of these. Earth is the only planet known to have life and liquid water on the surface. We have found liquid water below the surface on other places, but we're the only one with water on the surface. Our moon is the farthest any people have traveled. Only 12 people have walked on the moon. More have traveled there. Some have orbited around the moon, but only 12 have walked there. Um, and that's the farthest people have gone in space. Vast majority people just in orbit around the Earth barely above the surface compared to our distance to the moon. So that is Earth. So now that we've been to Earth, our next planet is Mars with a total of 114 steps from the Sun. We're at 75, so let's continue on to Mars. Welcome to Mars. Here we have Mars. Mars is the sesame seed that's been outlined here. And you have two moons, Phobos and Deimos, which are the little poppy seeds. Now in reality, those poppy seeds are way too big for Phobos and Deimos, which we'll find out why in just a moment with our interesting facts about Mars. So Mars has a day almost the same length as on Earth. Earth is 24 hours, Mars is a little bit longer than that, but not by much. Mars has a thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide and is home of the largest volcano in the solar system called Olympus Mons. It's three times the height of Mount Everest and it also has the largest canyon in the solar system called Mariner Valley that would reach all the way across the United States. Um, it would make the Grand Canyon look puny and insignificant in comparison. Uh, the two moons, Phobos and Deimos, are probably captured asteroids that got a little too close to Mars. Um, Mars is near the asteroid belt, and so it's probably uh, some stray asteroids that wandered too close to Mars. Mars is known as the red planet because of the red color that it gives off. That color is actually due to rust. And my uh, dirt here is very similar to that. It's basically there's iron in the soil and when it's exposed to water it rusts just like it does here on Earth. That's one of the reasons why we think Mars had water in the past is because of the evidence of rust in its soil. So. Uh, here we have a Mars-like backdrop to talk about the planet Mars. 
So I mentioned Mars is near the asteroid belt, so that's our next stop. We're going to visit three of the largest asteroids, uh, making quick stops at each one, and then I'm going to talk about all three of them at our third stop. So we're at 114 steps. Our first asteroid is 160 steps from the sun. So let's keep counting. So our first asteroid stop is Pallas, and all three asteroids are going to look the same. They're going to be poppy seeds. And uh, oh. so we're going to stop here just so you can see what Pallas looks like. And then we're going to continue on to Vesta, another 17 more steps to the next asteroid. So again, just a little poppy seed for asteroid Vesta. And then our third is going to be 30 more steps. So here we are at Ceres. So our interesting facts about our asteroids, of uh, those three, Ceres was the first to be discovered in 1801. Uh, 1802, Pallas was discovered, and then Vesta was discovered in 1806. Vesta's surface shows signs of ancient lava flows, which is very unique. Ceres is uh, the largest of the asteroids, and it's actually large enough to be round in shape, which is why it is now considered a dwarf planet. Um, all three of these, when they were first discovered, were called planets. Uh, they orbited the sun, and that at that time, you know, from 1801 to 1806, if it went around the sun, it was considered a planet. Then more asteroids were found. And as more and more asteroids were found within the asteroid belt, a uh, decision was made that we can't call all of these things planets. And that's when they were reclassified as asteroids instead. This region uh, between Mars and Jupiter is where about 75% of asteroids are found, and this is the asteroid belt. Now you saw how tiny they were and how many steps I had to take between each one. Even though there are a lot of asteroids, they're all very, very small, and they are very, very spread out. So if you were to fly through the asteroid belt, you would have a hard time seeing a single asteroid. They are that spread out. So we've made it through the asteroid belt. We're at a total of 207 steps. Our next stop is Jupiter at 389 steps. So I'm going to be walking for a little bit here. So while I'm walking, Adam's going to talk to you a little. So while Robin is walking and counting her steps, I'm obviously behind her filming her uh, with her iPhone, but uh, what we're doing is that we're learning about the scale of our solar system. 
Now what we just passed is, is in the solar system is considered the terrestrials, uh, places with rocky surfaces that you could physically walk on, even though you probably couldn't visit it or you'd have to have special equipment to be there, but there is a hard surface. There are also the terrestrial planets and the asteroids are very small compared to where we're going, which is the Jovian system, uh, which is uh, the next four planets and also the four largest planets. The next one, Jupiter, as Robin mentioned, is the largest planet. And we're going to be entering the what's called the gas giants, which is Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, the next two planets are the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Now the terrestrial worlds, um, our best understanding of our solar system as to why the terrestrial worlds are that way, why we have four small rocky worlds near the sun, and then we have a big distance to get to uh, what are these very giant planets that are mostly made of gas and ices. Uh, with just a very small rocky core. And that's because of heat from the sun. The closer to the sun you are, the warmer it's going to get. Uh, that's a very basic fact and understanding. And so uh, with those planets being closer, if it did have a lot of gases, a large atmosphere, a lot of it probably would have been boiled away or blown away by the sun's solar wind. Whereas where we're now, at Jupiter, it's not as hot. It's a lot colder. And uh, also, the, they were, these planets were able to get very, very large and actually hold an atmosphere of, uh, of such size. So, as Adam mentioned, our Jovian planets are much larger. Whoa. So here's our scale model for Jupiter. This actually is a little uh, big, it's a, but it was the closest I could find, um, a little moon toy. And the four largest of Jupiter's moons, Io, which is a poppy seed, Europa, poppy seed, Ganymede, a sesame seed, and then Callisto, another sesame seed. And our moon distances are uh, to scale as well as our sizes on this. So some fun things to know about Jupiter. It is the largest planet in the solar system. It has more mass than all the other planets combined. So if you took all of the other planets, smushed them together and made one planet, Jupiter would still have more mass. It is home to the Great Red Spot. Uh, that is a storm that has been around for at least 400 years. It does change in size. It's been getting smaller over the last several decades, but it still hasn't disappeared. So we don't know how long it will last, if it is forever, or if it will someday go away. These four largest moons that we have on our model are called the Galilean satellites because Galileo was the first one to see them through a telescope and discover them. Io, the one closest to Jupiter, it has active volcanoes. It's actually the most volcanically active object in our solar system. And that's because of the gravity from Jupiter, uh, basically pushing and pulling on this poor little moon and melting its interior with all of that uh, back and forth friction motion that it feels. The other three probably have uh, liquid water. Europa and Ganymede, we are very confident, have liquid water under an icy crust. Uh, Callisto, there's hints that it might. We're not as confident on that one. Um, these are not the only moons of Jupiter. Jupiter has a lot. The number keeps changing. Um, in the 60 to 70 range is what I've last heard. So it's somewhere in that ballpark. Um, most of the others are much smaller, so they're harder to find. Uh, it's when spacecraft go by Jupiter, we'll find new ones, or if we get you know, bigger and better telescopes, we'll find new ones. But it has a whole lot of moons. Uh, but these are the ones that are uh, most significant because of their size and because of their characteristics. 
So we've just been to Jupiter. Next up is Saturn. We are at 389 steps. Saturn is 714 steps. So we're just a little past halfway to Saturn at this point. So enjoy Adam's commentary while I talk. Well, I, sorry, not talk, count. Yes, Robin will be counting while she walks. She is very talented. And I will be talking while holding the, the camera. Uh, so we're going off to Saturn. Now, as you could see how Jupiter's system was, Jupiter was huge. And the four satellites that she talked about, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are actually uh, moons that formed with Jupiter. They are much larger than all the other moons of Jupiter. All the other moons are captured asteroids because uh, we know this because, well, one, they're really, they're like rocks. They're just small rocks. They're a tiny fraction of the other moons in their size. Uh, also, some of them orbit the planet in very uh, odd ways. Uh, they don't orbit along and rotate with Jupiter. So, um, they are captured asteroids. And there's a lot of interesting features about those four satellites. The volcanoes in Io that were discovered, the water ocean down below the uh, crest of ice on Europa, which is one of our best chances of discovering potential life. We don't know yet, but there are missions being planned to actually uh, investigate that. We're going off to Saturn. Saturn's another gas giant planet. It's almost as big as Jupiter, but uh, it also has those amazing rings. Now, all four of the Jovian planets have a ring system of some sort. Saturn's rings, though, are very stable in a sense. And the reason is because of resonance. There are small moons that are called shepherding moons that are actually keeping the rock and ice that make up the rings of Saturn um, as a ring system. Because after billions of years, even millions of years, those particles in the ring system should be gone. They should either have uh, fell, fallen into Saturn or flung away from, away from Saturn. But on the edges of what we perceive as those very distinct boundaries of the rings, <clears throat> we, uh, there, there are these uh, shepherding satellites. So these small moons, with their gravity, shepherd in. Oh, a particle's trying to leave the ring system, or well, the gravity of that moon as it goes by pulls it back in. Same for the other side of the ring system. So it's a very unique uh, situation. If you ever get to look at very close up photographs, very high detailed images of Saturn's rings from the uh, Cassini mission uh, through the, uh, from Cassini, you're going to see very detailed in the rings, a lot of like millions of lines <clears throat> or ringlets. The, and this is actually a harmonic that with the orbits of these particles around the planet um, are following. So it's not just random particles all over the place. The rings themselves are made up of rock and ice, like I mentioned. And uh, the rocks are maybe, um, you know, dust to maybe the size of a house. And the ice is like snow here on Earth, and it reflects sunlight very well, which is why we see the ring so easily. So we have reached Saturn. I'm getting my little notes in order here. So here we have a model of Saturn as a cat toy. And I made a black background, but still kind of hard to see, is the rings around Saturn. I used salt to represent the rings. And I have two of Saturn's moons here, Rhea and Titan, the two largest of Saturn's moons. 
for our interesting facts, Saturn is best known for its ring system. Uh, the rings, while when they face us like this, are easy to see, but if they're edge on, they actually disappear. And that happened when Galileo was looking at Saturn. When he first saw Saturn, he saw the rings more or less like this. His telescope wasn't that good. And so he described it as looking like Saturn had ears and thought maybe it was two moons. The next time he looked at Saturn, which had to have been years later, uh, it happened to be when the rings were edge on. He didn't see the rings at all. So he had no idea what happened to those ears and just kind of forgot about it. People later were able to look at Saturn with better telescopes and figure out that in fact it was a ring going around Saturn. Of all the planets, Saturn has the lowest density and its density is lower than the density of water. So that means if you could somehow find a bathtub big enough and fill it up with water, put Saturn in that bathtub, it would float on that water. Of course, you never want to put Saturn in a bathtub because it would leave a ring. <laughs> uh, Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system. Ganymede, the moon of Jupiter, is the largest of the moons. Titan comes in second. It's a very close second. Um, Titan has an atmosphere. It has an atmosphere of nitrogen. Our atmosphere is primarily nitrogen. We have sent a spacecraft, now since demised, called Cassini, that went in orbit around Saturn, and it included a little probe that it sent to the surface of Titan. And so we actually got images of the surface of Titan. Titan has lakes but not of water, of liquid methane. And so it is a very unusual location in our solar system, possibly another place where we could find life, but probably not life as we know it here on Earth. So we have visited Saturn. That's the last of the planets that can be seen naked eye. And that is largely because of how close they are to Earth. We are going to get a lot farther now. Our next planet is Uranus. Saturn was 714 steps from the Sun. Uranus is a little more than double that distance at 1,436 steps from the Sun. So I'm going to do a subtraction here and it will be 722 more steps before we get to Uranus. We just left Saturn. We're going to Uranus. Have to go down our driveway. And uh, with Saturn's rings, I wanted to mention, uh, Robin did mention about how thin they are and that they look like they would disappear when they went edge on to our point of view, from our viewpoint. Well, obviously they don't truly disappear, but what's happening is that the rings are so thin they're only about 300 feet thick think about that 300 feet thick whereas the uh you know the width of the rings themselves is enormous we're going off and leaving the gas giants Jupiter and Saturn, and we're going down towards the, shouldn't really say going down, we're going down our driveway, but uh, we are going out to the ice giants. Now remember I mentioned about heat, temperature from the sun. Well, it's now getting very cold, uh, less than 100 Kelvin out here, and it is so cold that instead of a thick, gassy atmosphere, the gas is actually starting to freeze 
but not free solid, but turn into kind of a slush. So think of it as a slushy uh, planets, Uranus and Neptune. Though I don't think I would want any because both have methane in their atmosphere. So not very pleasant. But uh, still, as you can tell by our distance, we're getting very far away from the sun. Now in the astronomy world, just like in any profession, you get to kind of hear and see things and learn about things that uh, the general public doesn't really hear about until many years later. Um, I remember long ago back in the University of Florida where I went to school that uh, I was able to see Heidi Hamill give a lecture about Uranus. She was basically the authority on the planet because she was using the Hubble Space Telescope to view the planet and was doing all of the pertinent and most important research at the time. This was back in the 1980s and she used the term ice giants and that was the first time that any of us had heard that term but it was uh, obvious as to uh, why, based on the research and what they were able to find out. So even though it's common to call them ice giants now, it didn't really hit the public until maybe about 15 years ago. But we were able to hear about it uh, about 30 years ago. So a little kind of a background story there. Now we're walking through our neighborhood. And even though it should be getting cold and icy and slushy uh, for the ice giants, it's pretty warm out. Kind of another little behind the scenes story about Uranus and Neptune. I should probably wait for the next planet, but uh, one of our fellow grad students was actually working at uh, STSCI, the Hubble Space Telescope Institute, and was uh, doing some research on Neptune and was part of the team that developed the algorithm for the cameras on Voyager as it flew by the planet to actually track the planet because it was going by so quickly at that time past the planet but the exposures for the cameras were so long hours long I think that they had to be able to rotate the camera at a certain pace in order to get the actual photo to get an actual photograph that was usable to see what the planet looks like and he was part of that team um, his name was Bill Owen and uh, he actually got his doctoral thesis out of that work and so kind of an interesting thing with that and you have to watch out for those space dogs that might get you out here in the ice giants well, a little sideshow action Yes. <laughs> if you want to try to see Uranus and Neptune, uh, you can. Um, you can use a telescope any modest telescope, I'm even a small store-bought one, you should be able to see those planets in the sky. Of course they have to be, you know, in the sky, not below the horizon, but they are easily visible. The hard part is finding them. They're very faint. 
but they're, with, they're well within the grasp of the light gathering power of a telescope. Uh, binoculars will even show Uranus and Neptune. Um, and, but you have to really know exactly where you're looking uh, and have nice clear skies in order for the binoculars to work like that. But you can see them. Uranus looks a little bluish in a telescope. Uh, like a soft kind of a blue ball and Neptune looks green and with magnification especially with the telescope uh, obviously when I when you see them as a disk you need a telescope and probably at least 150 power or more to really see them we have made it to Uranus so on our model Uranus is a hazelnut and again we have just a handful of moons uh, in this case Titania and Oberon uh, Uranus does have more moons than that so our I got my interesting facts here interesting facts for Uranus this was the first planet to be discovered as I had mentioned all the others we could see naked eye for the planets Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, dwarf planet, uh, you did need a telescope. Now, in fact, you can see Uranus naked eye under ideal situations, but for the most part, you do need a telescope to see it. Um, William Herschel first saw it in 1781. He wanted to name it George after the King of England. That didn't go over well with other countries. So, uh, continued with the mythology theme, and the name Uranus is the father of Saturn in mythology. It is the most tilted of the planets. Its axis is tilted a little over 90 degrees, so as it goes around the sun, it's actually orbiting on its side, which gives it very extreme seasons because you'll have times when, say, the North Pole is pointed towards the sun. It's continuously in sunlight. South Pole is in continuous darkness. And then a half orbit later, that swaps. Um, this is uh, a planet that was only visited once by a spacecraft. In January of 1986, the Voyager 2 spacecraft visited Uranus. It just did a flyby. As Adam was talking about our friend from graduate school working on Neptune, it was that same spacecraft after it flew past Uranus. It continued on to Neptune before leaving the plane of the solar system. So we don't have a whole lot of information about Uranus beyond that one flyby. And uh, there are proposals to send spacecraft back to Uranus to actually go into orbit around Uranus and gather more information. But that remains to be seen if that will happen or not. So our next stop is Neptune. And we've got another 813 more steps to go. So uh, enjoy Adam's commentary while I try to keep track of my counting. Yes, I'm not sure who has the harder job, Robin, to try to keep track of counting or me doing the banter while filming, but uh, we'll give it a shot. Now, um, what we're seeing, what we're, what we're doing is going off to Neptune, the eighth planet. Uh, as I said earlier, you can see it with a telescope. It does look greenish. There's a small green, slightly out of focus looking kind of planet because it has no defined at hard edge really because it's I guess or an ice giant planet uh, very far away um, but it is distinctive compared to other stars now I mentioned about the Voyager spacecraft and Robin mentioned Voyager 2 well there were two Voyager spacecraft of course if one of them is called Voyager 2 uh, they were launched within a few months of each other I can't remember the exact amount of time but um, the purpose was uh, a couple things. One was redundancy. What if one of the crafts just failed for some reason? There was another craft that was out there 
and the first craft that would fly by uh, an outer planet would then be able to um, we would learn from that first one to then give commands to the second spacecraft to maybe look for more details <clears throat> uh, of a planet based on the discoveries from the first spacecraft. Well, both Voyager 1 and 2 went by uh, Jupiter and Saturn. At that time, and the way their paths were, it was decided, let's extend the mission to go out to Uranus and Neptune. They were actually not part of the original Voyager missions. Now, with that, so Voyager 2, mission was ex ex extended. All righty. So the, uh, sorry about that, so the uh, Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 2, was then decided to continue on. Based on its trajectory, it could go off to uh, Uranus and Neptune, which was a really great thing because it was not even part of the original plan. So they were set off to go off in that direction. Voyager 1, uh, I, I should, okay, with Voyager 2 then, it obviously took many years to get out to Uranus and then Neptune. Uh, the reason the spacecraft survived for so long, um, one, it was built so well uh, by JPL and NASA, but also, and mainly so, it had an RTG, which is a radiothermal generator, um, which is a, basically it's a device that has some uh, nuclear material in it that isn't, it's not a nuclear reactor, but when this uh, nuclear material gives off heat naturally, and that heat was converted into electricity, and the heat was also used to keep the uh, spacecraft uh, warm enough to operate. And so, those are the RTGs that are on Voyager 1 and 2 actually are considered to be able to last for about a hundred years, which is pretty amazing. And we're still getting signals from these craft. So even when they pass by uh, Neptune, they pass the heliopause long past their expected lifetime. So the really amazing craft. So Voyager 2 went off to see Uranus and Neptune, um, and now we're getting close-ish, I guess, to Neptune. Now Uranus, by the way, I don't know if it was mentioned, but rotates on its side. Something happened in its past. So um, we don't know if maybe another planet or moon-sized object crashed into the inner core of Uranus or something else happened but there had to have been some type of energy application by some event probably an impact of some sort or even a rogue star that uh, passed by our solar system and the gravitational force of it rotated Uranus but rotate, Uranus rotates on its side it's tilted just past 90 degrees so its seasons are unusual in that it has a 40-year um, orbit, and it's about 10 years for every season. <clears throat> and with that, when it's near spring and fall on Uranus, a lot more you, what we start seeing are cloud formations because of the energy from the sun hitting the, the equatorial region of the planet. When the poles are pointed towards the sun, the uh, atmosphere system kind of steadies down. 
and we don't see as much features. So these are dynamic, changing worlds. They have weather, even though it's a slushy world, they have weather systems. Uh, the laws of physics still apply. Um, and uh, just like how we have storm systems, and if you look at the Earth from space and see it pass through time, you can see uh, bands of storm systems and cloud systems that are just above and below the equator of the Earth. Uh, this is from the Coriolis effect and the, you know, the rotation of the planet, but also the differential rotation of the planet as you go higher and lower in latitude, as you go towards the poles. These same effects occur in space on other worlds. You are going to hear an interesting story from Robin about the discovery of Neptune. Uh, she did say earlier that the planets up through Saturn, we've known about them. Everybody's always known about them. They're visible with the unaided eye. Uh, Uranus was the first planet to be discovered, and uh, accidentally so by William Herschel, who wanted to name it after the King of England at the time, uh, which obviously did not uh, bode well with the scientific community at the time, uh, nor would it ever. So we kept to the same naming conventions of uh, the Greek or Roman gods. Now let's learn about Neptune. We made it to Neptune, the rushing waters of Neptune. And uh, like Uranus, we've got our hazelnut. Uranus and Neptune are about the same size. So they're kind of considered twin planets. And uh, one of its moons, Triton, the largest of its moons, um, I think there's like 17 known moons for Neptune. Uh, there's probably more, we just haven't seen them. So, Adam mentioned that I was going to talk about the discovery of Neptune. After the discovery of Uranus, as people started watching it and getting better and better data about its orbit, it didn't seem to move right. It was like something was pulling on it. And so people predicted maybe there's another planet past Uranus and its gravity is affecting its motion. So some people started working on it. Um, in 1845, British astronomer John Couch Adams, uh oh, I just lost Neptune, <laughs> predicted where it was going to be. Now, in England at that time, uh, astronomers had to go through a person called the Astronomer Royal, who was kind of the chief astronomer. And there were a lot of issues in the communication. The Astronomer Royal kind of dismissed these predictions. And so nobody bothered to even look in the place that Adams had predicted. At the same time in France, uh, the following year, Urbain Le Verrier made a prediction that was very similar to Adams, but he didn't have to go through a pompous astronomer royal and was able to contact a friend of his in Germany, Johann Gall, who was a very good observational astronomer, told Gall where to look, Gal pointed his telescope, and there it was. So, both Adams and Le Verrier get credit for making the predictions, and Gal gets credit for actually seeing it the very first time. Um, Adam mentioned about Voyager 2. Neptune was the last planet visited by Voyager 2 before its trajectory took it up and out of the plane of the solar system. So um, again, not a lot of information because it was just a very quick flyby of our uh, blue planet, represented by a brown 
nut. Um, but is like Uranus an ice giant? So maybe one day we'll have a mission dedicated to Neptune and we'll learn more about it that we didn't know uh, up to now. All right, we've got one more stop to make, and that is Pluto out in the Kuiper Belt. So we've got another 700 steps to make it to uh, our last planetary object. Robin did mention about planetary object. It is, in a sense, a planetary object. It is in our solar system, uh, just like the asteroid belts and the asteroids are and the Kuiper belt objects are. And of course, you have learned that uh, Pluto is now considered not a true planet because its orbit is not cleared of similar sized objects. It's part of the Kuiper belt, just like the asteroids. Uh, when they were discovered 150 years ago that uh, it was there was just too many objects in the same area so instead of them being called planets they were called minor planets and then uh, labeled asteroids so the term minor planet or asteroid will uh, be correct to say about the objects that are between mars and jupiter going off to Pluto into the Kuiper Belt. It's getting extremely cold out here. Uh, there was a spacecraft that went out past Pluto within the last few years now uh, called New Horizons. And this spacecraft was, um, was designed to be fast and very small because its primary goal was to get out to Pluto without it taking forever. Uh, it too has an RTG in order to be able to operate um, in the extreme cold out by Pluto. It's uh, Pluto, you're getting out to about like 30 Kelvin now. And um, with that, the craft was designed to be small. It's not microscopic, it's not the size of a toaster. Nothing like that. It was probably the size of a small car, but they needed the fastest rocket possible, the most powerful rocket possible, because they needed speed behind this spacecraft. The distance at 40 astronomical units away, even at the speed that they eventually did do with planet flybys to get gravity assist to go faster, uh, still took nine years. <clears throat> nine years to get out to Pluto. Also, it had to have technology that not only could last at least nine years in deep space, handling a heavily vibrating rocket as it launched and then going off into extreme colds and passing um, out through, you know, the effects of solar wind and everything else and also the potential for micrometeorite impacts and everything <clears throat> but the technology had to be such that it could handle the mission itself which is was to fly by the planet or the dwarf planet I should say it's my mistake and so when it flew by it only had like less than half a day to approach, fly by, and pass. So it was extremely tight as far as the um, what it had to do, what it had to photograph, all the other instruments that were taking all kinds of other data um, had to occur. And um, 
they had to use what are what we now have as common devices as solid state drives uh, which are now in every you know cell phone and laptop or something like an iPad or tablet that all uses solid state technology meaning there's no moving parts well the spacecraft this was launched about a dozen years ago and that solid state technology was brand new at the time and they had to have enormous amount of storage so you, even right now when it's still com when it is common now it's still quite expensive can you imagine the cost and the uniqueness of those devices. Um, NASA is, just by the nature of the missions, which is uh, essentially their goal, is to kind of keep pushing the boundaries, uh, not only of exploration, but also of technology that we all benefit from that. But it takes many years for it to eventually get to the commercial level, where we just get it in normal products. But, you know, the whole concept of cell phones can be traced back to the NASA, NASA missions and the Apollo missions. Getting back to the New Horizons spacecraft, so it flew by. We didn't know what to expect. Well, it turns out that while it was going out, while the craft was going to Pluto, it wasn't there yet, it's about halfway, the Hubble Space Telescope was used to monitor Pluto. And guess what? It found two more moons. So Pluto has five moons, but uh, two more. You know, it, it was only known as three moons at the time of launch and it turned into uh, five minutes. And then they were starting to wonder, could there be a ring system? Could there be a potential for impact? So they actually had to change the mission slightly and send all new code in order to adjust for this. Um, new development. Well, it turns out everything was safe and good, which is great. The images that it sent were pretty amazing. Uh, of course, it's, we expected it to be covered with ice, but there's also a lot of exposed rock, and it had an atmosphere. Now, we always knew that it kind of had an atmosphere when uh, Pluto, in its orbit around the sun, it's actually very elliptical. It's not very round like all the other planets, like the eight planets. And so, um, when it gets to its closest in its orbit at perihelion, um, to the sun, the ice will melt and sublimate and create a thin atmosphere. Then when Pluto in its orbit is getting farther from the sun and gets colder, and so that's a very slight change in temperature, uh, the atmosphere freezes onto the surface. But um, that was discovered. So we'll let Robin continue to talk about Pluto. We have made it to Pluto. And when I do this activity with my students, at this point, they're saying uh, Pluto shouldn't be a planet. We shouldn't have to walk this far. Uh, here's Pluto, little poppy seed, and the largest of its moons, Charon, also a poppy seed. And we have walked 2,957 steps from the sun to make our way out to Pluto. We're a little over a mile from Pluto, from the sun. Um, some of our interesting facts. Pluto was discovered in the 20th century by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930. In 2006, Pluto was changed from a planet to a dwarf planet. Pluto's moon, Charon, is about half the size of Pluto, so they are sometimes called a double planetary system. We are in the Kuiper Belt, and the Kuiper Belt extends from just a little past Neptune to well beyond Pluto, thousands of icy objects are in the Kuiper Belt. And so it's very much like the story of the asteroids. We found the asteroids, we thought they were planets, and then we found more and discovered, no, this is a belt of stuff. We found Pluto, we thought it was a planet, then we discovered it's in this belt of stuff, and so it's not a planet anymore. But people's hearts were uh, tugging at the thought of Pluto not being called any kind of planet. And the category of dwarf planet was created to categorize things that are round, like Pluto, like the asteroid Ceres. They orbit the sun, but they're in a belt of objects. They're not in a clear orbit. 
And so Ceres, Pluto, and a number of other objects also in the Kuiper Belt are now known as dwarf planets. A couple things about our walk. If we were to walk to the next nearest star, we would be walking to Pakistan. So uh, from East Tennessee to Pakistan, look for a Death Star cat house, and that would be the next nearest star. Other thing is the pace that we have been walking. Light from the sun takes about four hours to get to Pluto. If we hadn't been stopping along the way, this would have taken roughly a half hour. So we are traveling at eight times the speed of light. So, you know, Einstein must have been wrong because clearly we are traveling faster than light in our little walk through the solar system. I hope you've enjoyed it and thank you for bearing with us.